There we are. We are live on Facebook. Hey guys, how you doing? Good evening. How are you? Good. Good, uh, good, uh, good, good, day, good day. Good evening. Good awesome evening. to be here. Uh, amazing, amazing show lined up today. Very uh, important. Very important very show. Very important. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, let, 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 we'll let, let our audience kind of uh, file in and, uh, you know, turn on, turn on their Facebook and uh, join us. Thank you, everybody that's joining us. Thank you for for coming. Uh, thank you for being interested in, in, in what's going on in Armenia and what's going on in the diaspora as it relates to, you know, helping Armenia and Artsakh, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you, Dave Rich. Good to see you. Um, we got a lot to cover today. We have a special guest that's going to help us do a lot of that. Um, and uh, David, give us, give, us a, give us a warm welcome. Yeah, well, no, well said, Greg. Thank you. Obviously, there's some very troubling developments happening in Armenia proper right now that we're going to get to um, and a number of other things. Uh, but we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, he is the President Emeritus of the American University of Armenia. Everyone, please welcome uh, Dr. Armin Der Kurigian, someone who I have the pleasure of working with on the Bay Area Artsakh Task Force, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But Dr. Der Kurigian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Welcome to Arach Media tonight. Thank you for inviting me, David and Greg. And Richard, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for being here, for sure. Yeah, so there's obviously quite a bit to talk about, but uh, doctor, if you could just share with everybody a little bit about your background. Obviously, you've, you've spent quite a bit of time in Armenia. You have uh, experience also um, at, at major roles with uh, UC Berkeley here in the Bay Area and uh, running or leading the uh, and co-founding uh, the Armenia, American University of Armenia. Just share with everybody a little bit about your background um, as we get started here tonight. Yeah, well, uh, I uh, was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley for many years, 37 years. Uh, and uh, uh, I was also instrumental in starting the Armenian Studies program there. That was another Armenian activity I was involved in. But in 1988, uh, when the earthquake in Spitak happened, I was uh, a member of the US National Academy of Sciences team that went to Armenia. Uh, Miran Akbabian from USC at the time and I were the two Armenians in a team of about 22 earthquake engineers and seismologists. And so it is during that visit and a subsequent visit in February of 1989 that the idea came about that, you know, in order to provide a long term uh, assistance to Armenia, education we found to be an important thing. And that led to the idea, a proposal, Luis Simon provided funding, we approached the University of California, they agreed to, um, to uh, help us, we have a formal affiliation. So it's a miracle that it happened, to be honest with you. I have a, I, I gave a talk on 20th anniversary when uh, I likened this to the lining up of the planet because many things had to happen coincide for this to happen. And so now this year actually is the 30th anniversary of the university. Oh, wow. We are very strongly affiliated with the University of California. The chair of the board of trustees is, a, uh, is the former provost of the University of California. We have an endowment, 90, close to $90 million that is managed by the uh, fund managers of the University of California and, and so on. So we have, uh, and the university has prospered. We went from 100 students. Now we have close to 2000 students. Uh, we have um, uh, 13 degree programs, undergraduate and graduate degree programs. And uh, uh, Students are very happy. The university is growing. And so uh, I was president for five years. I must say uh, one of the most uh, uh, rewarding and, uh, and uh, inspiring periods of my life for those five years I spent in Armenia, in Yerevan, uh, presiding over the university. That's excellent. Uh, and yeah, that's great. So that's the story. That's great. What would you say 
Uh, this is a big question to ask. What would you say is your, for lack of a better word, uh, favorite moment or most moving moment for you in during those five years uh, as president at AUA? What of course, the say? interactions with students was the, you know, I, 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 my apartment, the president's apartment is in the inside uh, Karma Zavetisian building. And sometimes uh, I had not slept well, uh, I had worries all night, and I would be sort of tight and, and upset. I would open the door, come in the hallway, you see these smiling students, your mood changes, because it, it, it really is so rewarding to see the students happy, the students excited, smiling, seriously studying. So that interaction was wonderful. And I must say another case where it, would, it was really, really pleasant. On several occasions, I had people who came to my office, they made appointments, came to my office and sat down and we talked. And then they said, I would like to make a donation of million dollars. <laughs> Or, My goodness, wow. or I would like to make a donation of you know scholarship. I want to establish a scholarship. It was a wonderful experience to have people who appreciated what the university was and wanted to support students. Uh, so uh, those are two examples. Uh, Doctor, uh, I have a quick question because a lot of people I know actually got, got you know, came through AUA, my cousins, and I have a lot of cousins in Armenia. So the institution is very important to the kind of to the new, uh, to the birth of the country, right? Um, is it true you said there's an affiliation with the UC system, right? And yes. is the degree, and uh, this is for those of you that don't know, once you go to AUA, is the degree transferable or it has some kind of accreditation with the UC system, essentially, quote unquote? Well, the, the degree is AUA degree. Mm -hmm. AUA is not a campus of UC. It's right. a separate <laughs> university on its own. But we have an accreditation. We have uh, Western Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation, which is the same accreditation that Berkeley, Stanford, all, uh, this is Western United States, California, yes. Oregon, Washington State, all of this. Uh, so any student having a degree uh, from AUA can apply for graduate degree here for doctoral after master's. And we have many, many examples. There are many mm -hmm. examples of going here or in Europe. Uh, it is an accredited degree by yeah. an American accrediting association. And that was very, that was very important in the establishment yes. of the university, right? Um, yes, uh, accreditation is extremely important. It's in a way, it's a stamp of standard that you are meeting a certain standard. Amazing. Um, could, would you be able to talk about the actual the, the co-founding of like how, how the how the idea not the idea came about but how, like what how were the integral happen? components because I mean AUA is such a legendary uh, well, the idea came about around a breakfast table of hush you know what hush is <laughs> yes I did <laughs> yeah, this was uh, February 26 1989 I was in Armenia my friend said let's go skiing and I said, fine. In the morning, he drove to a friend's home. I said, we're going skiing. He said, no, we have to have breakfast. So I went in there. There was a big table of hush. Across from me was sitting Yuri Sarkisian, who was the rector of the Polytechnic at the time. That was the first time I met him. We are good friends now. And then we went around the table talking about how this was after the earthquake, how, how the Did, uh, uh, did we lose the he course? might have froze. Okay. Uh -oh. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Bear with us, everyone. This, yeah, is, thank this you. is the new uh, the new digital normal. Um, yeah. Uh, we will hold on. So for those that uh, you know, my kind of my struck starstruck understanding of AUA is, I have so many cousins that got their uh, uh, what do you call it. Uh, postgraduate stuff from AUA and now they have undergraduate as well which was a big step forward so that it's no longer just a uh, 
you know, uh, like a yeah. master's program. There, you're back. Yeah, you're we're back. back. All right, back. all right. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, so there was a good relationship between the two countries. It occurred to me that, hey, uh, this uh, may not be impossible. So I said, Yuri, this is not impossible. I said, I think about it. And then all day we were skiing. I was thinking about this, you know, the bridge between the country and the diaspora. This, you know, so when I came back, I wrote a proposal, and then I contacted Miran Agbabian because we were there together earlier after the earthquake, and I knew him well. I'd worked in his company. I knew he's a man of uh, high repute and and a lot of influence both in the Armenian American communities. So together we wrote this proposal and we sent it to every congressman who had said something about Armenia. We sent it to Armenian organizations, many, many people. And Luis Simon responded with a letter, five lines. This is excellent idea. We at AGBO are prepared to fund it. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. That is how it got started. You can have many good ideas, but if there's no money behind right. it, right? That's, that's cool. right. That's and right. I guess, I guess, as they say, the the rest, the rest is history. And here we are, thirty years uh, this year, right? It's going to be 30th, 30th anniversary. Yeah. Well, I'm you know, you need you need you need a good idea, you need funding, and you need action behind it. You know, exactly. Yeah, right. and we were, and then Stefan Karamardian joined us a few months later, Amazing. and so the three of us plus Louise are sort of the founder. Amazing. Very good. Um, and, I, and I believe, uh, do you still sit on the board? Uh, Yervan Zorian does, yes, right? Yes. Zorian does as well, right? Or no? Yes, Yervan is a member. There are 23 or 24 members on the board. I'm very good. On the board, and I'm chair of the development committee. Very good. So you're still very, very involved. And uh, I mentioned uh, Dr. Yervan Zorian as well uh, to help segue because uh, yourself, me, Dr. Zorian and a number of others from our community all serve on the San Francisco Bay Area Artsakh yes. Task Force, which I've been mentioning on, on, on Arach Media for weeks now. And you, uh, Dr. Derek Regan, serve as chair of that committee. Why don't we give, or that task force rather, let's give everybody a little bit of background on what that task force is. And then we could talk about the the big event that's coming up on May twenty three. Yes. Yeah, so we'll if you don't it. mind, I'll uh, I'll share the, the 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 Facebook page really quick, sure. quickly. So thank you. Those great, who great. want to great, uh, get involved or at least pay attention and participate yeah, in some way, uh, there's the Ar the the Artsakh Task Force uh, site on uh, Facebook, and of course it'll have all the links on there. So the the assumption is if you're watching here, you're on Facebook or you uh, you can get on Facebook. Uh, this will also be on YouTube. Uh, but here's where you'll be able to pay attention to some upcoming events as yes, well. Yes, this is the exactly. most important. Yes. Yeah. Well, the task force was formed in October during the war with the idea of uh, helping uh, Artsakh and Armenia. And we are focused on that. We are an overarching uh, organization. That is, we try to work with all organizations in the Bay Area uh, we, to provide support to them, to coordinate uh, activities so that there's no duplication. Uh, we help them in any way we can. We provide information. One of the things we do, we bring uh, uh, representatives from Armenia and sometimes diaspora to talk about specific projects that we think are important for Artsakh and for Armenia and uh, uh, present in virtual uh, meetings. Uh, if there are people who would like to, uh, to participate and receive our announcements, it would be good to send us a notice. We will put them on our mailing list. Um, one of the events that we, one of the projects that we have been supporting very strongly is the Insurance Foundation for Servicemen, IFS. This is an organization in Armenia. It is a foundation, not a part of the government, but created by law, and it supports, provides significant amount of money to the families of deceased soldiers or the, to soldiers who have been disabled as a result of uh, defending our homeland. Uh, 
it's they there's a lump sum they pay ten to twenty thousand dollars and then they pay monthly uh, uh, amounts to the families or to the disabled soldiers for twenty years. So it makes their life uh, possible, fruitful, and uh, it is the minimum we could do for our soldiers. Mm -hmm. So this is a project uh, that we have taken on. On May 23, we have a virtual concert auction uh, fundraising event specifically uh, to support this activity. I must say every Armenian in Armenia who works gets a salary pays a certain amount to this fund. And that's where most of the funding is coming from. But because there has been such a, a big number of uh, deceased soldiers, uh, the foundation now needs a lot more money. And so we are trying to help with this fundraise. Uh, the, this is the announcement. It tells you how to register uh, you, the, uh, for the event, for the auction. It's important to register in advance. So I hope those who are listening, if they haven't already done so, they will go look at the website, look at the Facebook, uh, this announcement, and follow and register as soon as possible. We would like to have a good uh, participation on May 23. Uh, you know, participation can be lump sum. It can also be monthly contributions by families, as little as $10, $20, $50 a month. Uh, is 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 good, all right. So I hope that uh, listeners will register. And yeah, for uh, sure. So so what I'm hearing is that for for less than what uh, the cost of Netflix would be a month, you can actually help change someone's life. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. No and you know, I think those who contribute, we feel very good about that. You know, knowing that mm -hmm. you are uh, supporting directly supporting. Uh, families of the soldiers who lost their lives, their life, uh, or they lost their livelihoods, the uh, disabled ones, uh, you're supporting them. I think it gives a, a feeling of participating and being uh, a, a part of this national effort. Right. Well, I think there's a couple of things to say. First of all, uh, well, a few things to say. First of all, it's amazing work. Um, second of all, it's, it's, it's also amazing to see how much further the money that we have goes, uh, you know, elsewhere, Yeah, uh, you know, and, 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 and we shouldn't have to be begging each other for this kind of help. I mean, it should be one of those things that we do as a duty, uh, because so many of us feel so passionately about, you know, um, about the homeland and about the, the soldiers. I think it's great work. It's good stuff. And I mean, again, I'm so so happy we were able to uh, talk about uh, this this important initiative because I think everybody in the diaspora, you know, it's important for us to uh, link the two financially, especially because this is our way of kind of contributing. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people in need out there, and thank you for doing this. Obviously, through David, we hear a lot about the Artsakh Task Force, and because we're also part of all these Bay Area organizations. Yeah. I see the emails come through, but there's a lot of people out there that are listening that are not plugged into any particular organization. So we highly, highly encourage all of you to uh, kind of log in, register, contribute however you can, because this is a worthy, worthy cause. All of the uh, funds raised from the May 23 will go to, to the IFS, uh, which will yes. help compensate these families of fallen or injured soldiers. And you guys, not to, it's very, it's very sad, the situation. Armin, you touched on it. We actually had a meeting last night, the, the task force did. We had, uh, was it Sona Bagdasarian? Was that her last name? No, sorry, uh, yeah, she is, uh, she's head. Uh, what is her role again? Armin, I'll, I she want to is in charge you. of donor relations and fundraising. For the IFS. For the IFS. Right. She shared the very large numbers. Uh, you guys, it's, everyone needs to know this. We talked about it on Arach Media for we, for months now, but 3,036 mm -hmm. confirmed, yes. and then there's another- 3,036 three. already getting yes. uh, the, the uh, compensation. Eight. Yes, another 1,300 missing, which in all likelihood they will become uh, deceased uh, cases very tragically. Um, yes. So, and I don't believe POWs are, POWs are not part of this. I don't believe this number, so- uh, it's very important for us. And, and it, I think it was very wise of them 
uh, and it's our our duty, I feel, to help. It's very wise of them to reach out to the diaspora to help because of this immense uh, loss. Um, it cannot just fall on the burden of three million people, less than three million, and not even all those three million people are contributing the monthly contributions on their paychecks. I don't know what that number is, but it's it's not all of them, I'm sure. So it's very important very, for us to help. Yeah. Very worthy cause. Um, Dr. Decker, again, we kind of uh, will. I will continue uh, pushing this uh, this this initiative, and especially the the event on May that uh, Rich again 23rd, May twenty third. Yeah. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about your experience while you were at AUA uh, in the recent years, where you saw kind of uh, you know our, our, how Armenia was coming to uh, towards kind of the last few 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 months or years of your tenure there. Because it's a, it was an exciting time. It was it was a great time to be uh, in Armenia. And what your um, obviously you're still plugged in. What your understanding of the juxtaposition of the kind of um, the current mood and the situation in 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 the country is versus even as few few months back when you were in Armenia when you were last in in your position. Well, during the last year, uh, of course, was the first year after the revolution and uh, it was a very exciting time I must say very very exciting time the, seeing the opening seeing the dem democratic uh, uh, nature of the government um, I am now extremely sad to see this internal uh, very ugly fighting that is going on uh, I think it's very damaging um, the, the, there's no, you know, the name calling, fake news, you know, uh, uh, small things happen, sensationalizing, accusing this or accusing that, you know, this is just helping our enemies. Uh, I, I really think that uh, civility needs to come back, uh, more uh, thoughtful, um, uh, evidence-based discussions uh, not sensationalizing that is happening. Uh, I, I'll give an example. Um, for example, they, there has been a lot of talk about this educational reform. Uh, during my uh, year before the last year, in 2018, actually, just before the revolution, there was Ser Sarkisian's government was uh, introducing a new education law. And I was very heavily involved. In fact, I was in a committee with the deputy prime minister, Vace Caprielian. At the time, he was the deputy uh, prime minister uh, who was chairing this committee. I was a part of that committee to look at the law. And the law, I must say, from my standpoint, had many, many flaws. But uh, um, from a US standpoint, it was horrible. And fortunately, uh, they, they could realize themselves. And so there was a, a particular uh, grandfathering of uh, uh, a US so that we didn't have to follow certain articles of the law that were very, very prescriptive, very rigid. But the law said, that most of the members of the board of the university would be appointed by the president, by, by, by the government. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, Ser Sarkisian was the president of the board. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there was a day that they invited us to the parliament where this revised law had to be discussed and presented and voted. Between the last meeting we had and that present presentation at the parliament, somehow the president of the country, Serge Sarkisian, was again entered in the law as the president of the board. Right. right? Uh, so, so now I read articles criticizing the current government for proposing that two thirds of the board, a third comes from the ministry, a third comes from the uh, government. Uh, so big articles. Uh, University of California, 
as border regions, 23 members. 18 of them are appointed by the governor. 18 out of 23. These are people who make cont political contributions to the governor and the governor appoints them as regions. For 12 years of service. So if you look at, go on their website and look, you'll see there are many who were appointed even by Schwarzenegger or uh, Brown or previous governor. Right, right, right. right. You know, to me, the problem is not so much uh, where these people are appointed, but there are many other problems in the education system that are a lot more paramount. For example, the whole education system in schools, and, and maybe it's not as bad in, that it is like that in schools, but in universities, it's very prescriptive. It's mandated from above. The, uh, the, the professor comes to the classroom and he or she is know-it-all and gives lecture. You are not supposed to ask questions. You are not supposed to disagree with what is presented. You are just to memorize, take it in, take it in, take it in. Very little opportunity to discuss things, to have different points of view to question things. If you ask too many questions, you're interrupting the flow of the education. Whereas in, in our university at the AUA, we stress the participation of students in the education process. Questioning, asking questions, making points of view, uh, uh, countering points of view, and let this be discussed. So, um, there, there are these many other issues that are a lot more important. I read an article, David, you had forwarded to me about history. Armenian schools, including universities, are doing a very bad job of teaching Armenian history. Mm -hmm. I'm not a historian. I'm not a professor of history. I'm an engineering professor. But I have been also president of a university that also teaches us. I have had many, many conversations with faculty, with professors of history, both at AUA and here as well. Mm -hmm. What they are teaching in Armenia is history for Armenian history for Armenians. They are not teaching it in the context of world history, where Armenia fits within the world history. Some of it is mythology. You know, the mythology is good for entertainment. It's good for sort of national pride. But when you go to teach history, it's a different history I have to teach. And uh, so I, I see these articles, very sensational articles okay. about, you know, that uh, somebody compared Armenian history being taught in Armenia and Turkish history in Turkey. In fact, they are probably they are comparable. They're both somewhat based on mythology rather than facts and, uh, uh, and, and uh, records. And you know, uh, for, for us, particularly now in this time in our history, it is very important that we look at history in a dispassionate way and in the context of the world history, where we fit in the world. You know, it's I, not I, so I, important I, that we are the first Christian nation. I, I, totally, I totally understand that. And actually, thank you for bringing this subject up because I'm, uh, and I wanna be kind of very cognizant of time. Um, it was, uh, you jumped right into it. You jumped right into that one. It was important for us to understand you're the best person to talk to about this, about the, uh, this reform bill, right? That was one particular thing Thing, and I'm completely understand and agree with what you're saying that we need to we need educational reform. But I think what got people a little bit thrown off was when there were some uh, draft uh, uh, what do you call it uh, citations and built into the law of the the reform that dealt with the actual the 
the, the requirement, the mandatory requirement for Armenian language, literature, and history. So I think that's what it's threw off a lot of people in Armenia. And also, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm on, in my layman's terms, I completely didn't understand what that had to do with overall educational reform when it pertains to, you know, the utilization of a, of a language, you know? So that, that was yeah, kind religion, of- Religion, religion mm -hmm. was another- Yeah, religion. and then also the removal of the Armenian church history was also something that probably ruffled a lot of feathers with the society as well. Well, you know, uh, there's, one can talk a lot about this, but Absolutely. what the minister did mm -hmm. was left it to the academics to decide. Okay. Uh, he's saying, rather than the government mandate things, let the academics decide what is required, what is not required. Mm -hmm. Maybe some fields need more Armenian, maybe some fields less, let, need less Armenian. But, uh, you know, rather than the government politicians mandating that, he wanted to leave it to the academics, the university faculty, to decide collectively what and how it should be taught. That is how it's done here. Right. The politicians have no control over the academics. The professors in the university guard their right to control the academics like you know, they would not let any politician go close. So that is, uh, so there are other sides to this that uh, unfortunately, Yes, the, the whole process has gotten politicized mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and also a more passionate. People get passionate when the church or the language, you know, right. uh, these people are not anti Armenian. That well, I can it, it, it certainly has the illusion of that when you don't have all the information. And I think right. that. You know, and when you when when the, the information flow is questioned or questionable, it becomes harder to really understand the motives. And I think that's really the bigger point, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for thank you for uh, kind of explaining it to us, because I was uh, I was one of one of the people that that was confused. I was actually uh, well, curious to see because, you know, AUA was at the forefront of creating this newer and brighter kind of future generation of Armenians. Um, and uh, two years ago, we were on a panel, as we mentioned, and you mentioned that AUA was kind of central to uh, this ushering in a new generation, which kind of not contributed, maybe contributed to the revolution or not. I'm curious to wonder, are you uh, currently like, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your out, uh, uh, understanding and what is your opinion of the future of the Armenian, gen you know, the current generation, like, are you as passionate about, about them? And uh, do you think the current administration, uh, you know, given the nature of everything that happened, um, is dealing with these tremendous, uh, uh, you know, insurmountable difficulties in the right manner? Or, you know, it's, or what, what is your opinion on kind of the leadership in Armenia, and especially the new generation that's going to be actually carrying the, the country forward. I have very big hope on the new generation. Actually, young people in Armenia are very impressive. They typically are much more motivated to advance than people are here. Amazing. Probably because they, they have to work harder, but they are serious, they are passionate, they are motivated, and they are also uh, very uh, strong uh, nationalists. They, they, they do care for their country. They do really much more than you would find here or in Europe. Um, but the educational system uh, needs uh, big, big improvement. It's um, thinking in terms of the future, uh, I think uh, in terms of commerce, economy, and defense, uh, all three, it's extremely important for the country to have a strong education in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the weakest points right now. Right now, wow. In starting from schools, you know, at, after 10th grade, you select between science and math, humanities or economics. 
many schools don't even have the science and math selection because there are no students selected. Mm -hmm. They just, you can only select humanities and uh, economics. Uh, STEM education is in a very bad state in Armenia. Uh, AUA has a project funded by the US government to tune of about $500,000, where uh, we are training teachers of STEM who then train other teachers. We are they're working on producing resources for teaching, but this is a long way to go. Uh, there are not, not many qualified teachers of science and engineering because those who are there are hired by IT industry. The salaries are very low. The image of scientists and engineers in Armenia is very low. The highest images are bankers, business people, which are important, doctors, lawyers. These are all important. But for the country to go forward, particularly in terms of security, national security defense, I think a strong science and technology foundation is extremely important. Just for information, I'm working with a group now. Um, we, are, uh, we have some ideas. Uh, maybe at some other occasion, I'll talk about this, uh, of uh, a US-Armenia Binational Science Foundation that would provide uh, uh, research grants in science, technology, engineering, and education, uh, both countries, collaboration between the, both countries. Uh, but I think this is a, a, an area that is a big, big uh, worry area in terms of education, and uh, it's extremely important. We need to make scientists and innovators and engineers as heroes in Armenia, have positive image. Right now, uh, they don't have it. It's like the lowest class. If you're a scientist, oh, you're a scientist. You're not a banker. You're not a... Uh, Doctor, what, if anything, can we do from here to help impact the education system in Armenia? I feel like it's not something that's talked about much. Uh, what can be done? I mean, it's, it's obviously the science, technology, math, and so on, engineering, but also the history concerns you mentioned. What, if anything, can we do from here to help? Well, of course, uh, the biggest, uh, in my opinion, the biggest gift that the diaspora has given Armenia is AUA. Uh, AUA is not only a good university by itself, but it's also influencing the other universities. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this idea that I just mentioned, it's a diaspora in initiative. It's a US government, our, our proposal, this is a proposal, US government, Armenian government and diaspora joining together performing a foundation to help Armenian educational system and research institutions to advance in science, technology, and engineering. So this is one, one big chunk that we're doing, but uh, AUA is another element. Uh, I think uh, more educators getting involved uh, in Armenia, and one of the mechanisms is this collaboration that, that we are talking about uh, in this proposal. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's there, very there, there are many, many ways. Education is not cheap. Yeah. And I think diaspora needs to play a very significant role in directing resources that can, as I said, the you know the, the salaries of teachers are so low that uh, it doesn't make sense to, to, to become a teacher of science, teacher of mathematics. It's ridiculous. The salaries are extremely minimal, maybe $100 a month, $80 a month, or even less. Uh, wow. Now, this government has increased, uh, uh, not significantly, but they have increased. The previous governments didn't do much for teachers. Um, but we have a long, long way to go. Teaching has to become a respectable uh, 
a job, a job that gives a living wage. Thank you, doctor. And thank you for all of your work. Perhaps just two quick questions before we, we wrap up the, the discussion. Quick follow-up. How much of the, the payment or um, the salary of teachers is dependent on the local governments, maybe the local cities or local, uh, I'm not sure if they're called counties, what, what, what they're called in Armenia. How much of it depends on that, on them uh, versus? Uh, to be honest, I don't know where the source uh, okay. of the money funds is. Is it, I think it is the Minister of Education uh, that, okay. that has that. But I was listening to uh, Pashinyan's speech just uh, three days ago, and he was talking about, you know, they're raising property taxes for uh, uh, the property taxes for, let's say, big, uh, very expensive homes. You would have to pay much more. The property tax now is extremely small amount. Uh, for me, for example, I have an apartment there fairly good size, it's $150, something like that a year. But they're going to raise, depending on the value of your house. And he said, some of that money is earmarked for school uh, teacher salary. And similar to here, you know, here, uh, education, schools, uh, the, the budget for schools comes from property taxes. Mostly. Sure, sure. So, I mean, that's a step in the right direction then, right? I guess the only other question would be, and then when we can wrap, uh, thank you so much for your time, doctor, is if, if you have any insight on the current status of those proposed changes, obviously they were before the war, the war happened, and I think they became less, uh, less important, obviously, or they weren't on, uh, main uh, agenda items. Do we have any idea of where those uh what the status is of some of those David's changes. talking about the educational reform, right? Is that exactly, the education saying? reform. Like the, from yeah. what I understand, uh, uh, the president refused to sign it. Yes. Uh, and it's in limbo, or I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know where sure. it stands. But David, whether or not this law is passed doesn't make any difference. This is not the solution to any of the problems. Sure. The solution lies somewhere else. Sure. Yeah. Who appoints these boards? Uh, I think it's a secondary issue. Um, it's the fun, there are fundamental problems that need to be addressed that this law or the law, the previous law, I saw the revised law won't solve them. Sure. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us. For all of your work and leadership in the community, please keep us in the loop on the proposal that you mentioned, uh, because that sounds like it's going to be a very powerful way to help impact uh, the education system in Armenia positively, and we want to be able to help drive that as much as we can. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll get to see you soon uh, with the task force. And yes, speaking of the, task, the, yeah. of the ta task force, you have an event uh, on the 23rd. Uh, the link to uh, to actually si sign up for it uh, and to to participate is already up on uh, the, the the feed. So if you're paying attention to the feed, please uh, click click on that and find a way to participate. Yeah, six forty five p.m. Sunday, May twenty three. Yours truly will be emceeing. I look forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, and guys, this is not by any means just for the Bay Area. This is for anybody that is going to be awake at that time and their time zone. It is virtual. Is online. We need as much contribution as possible. It's not going directly to the government. It's going to this IFS, which is co uh, compensating these families of fallen and, and uh, um, injured soldiers. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you. Yes. And good night. Good night, good night, good night doctor. Night. Thank you so Take much. Care. See you soon. Take Bye. care. All right. That was amazing. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks, for, you guys. Uh, thanks for uh, getting him. To us, obviously, again, we're in that uh, it was a pertinent conversation to be had, uh, but now yeah. we are kind of a little bit short on time. Gentlemen, we have a lot to cover, and we actually have a lot to cover about the one thing um, true, that is true. very, very kind of front and center about uh, the um, yeah. issues in Armenia. Um, it, Greg, as we get started, I want to give, I want to continue to mention, tell everybody this. You have been calling this, trying to raise concern about this very situation that's unfolding right now how if we lose Artsakh 
it's directly threatening the existence of Armenia, right? Yes. Artsakh yes. and Armenia are essentially one nation and the borders now, Armenia's border is Azerbaijan because we have lost 80% of Artsakh. And here we are, the exact threat you've talked about, Greg, for years is unfolding before us. Let's get right into it, Greg. Let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. So um, which, uh, which, which portions would you like to kind of, uh, obviously, the number one issue that we all know that's, that's happening. And obviously, the things that I like to explain to people the best is to explain it through the utilization of maps. Um, obviously, what David is talking about, obviously, what Rich and I have been talking about, obviously, everything we've been talking about since the capitulation of November 9th was what is going to happen with Sunik. And initially, they're like, well, you're crazy. David, I remember having a conversation with you. Not you particularly said that, but I won't quote. Somebody, somebody, somebody said they will not come into Armenia. Exactly. Okay? They will not come. In. And my question to everybody listening out there is why not? Exactly. What? Because that's exactly them? what has happened. Let's. Why don't we go straight to what happened two yeah. nights ago, right? Or was it yesterday yeah. morning our time? Uh, yesterday morning, our time, uh, evening, their time, the day prior. Exactly. Um, was uh, 250, 250 Azeri soldiers mm -hmm. incurred, crossed the Armenian border in, around the Seb Lake area. Maybe we should start with the map, like you said, Greg. Um, mm -hmm. Or Okay. Here, let's just do this first. Let's Wait. show what's going on. Uh, but that's exactly what's happened. 250. This is not a small amount. Uh, Cross the border illegally into Armenian territory at Sev Lake. We'll show that on the map in a moment. Greg, go ahead, man. I'll give more background. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I was, uh, if it's possible for, for me to kind of, uh, Rich, I don't know if you gave Here, me control. I got it. You can go uh, ahead. Yeah, you have it. Go, you, you share. Perfect. You have it, Greg. Really quickly. Okie dokie. And I have the lake right here. So um, let's do this. I'm going to share my screen and let people understand what's going on. So for those of you that don't understand, right, or haven't, you know, uh, you know, paid attention in the geographic sense of the way. This is Armenia in red. This is Artsakh. Uh, can everyone see my my mouse? Yeah, where yep. was Artsakh? Right? Yeah, this uh, still is, David. Uh, Stepan Akert is uh, well within our reach, and one day I will visit it. Um, that being said, there is a lake uh, right here. Right there. Yeah. Sevlich Sanctuary, and it has this arbitrary, uh, you know, we will speak, uh, we will speak we will do an entire episode on why the borders are the way that they are and why Armenians are so ill-educated to go, well, that's the international border and how that is a bunch of baloney. But regardless of that, 24 hours ago, even though this lake, quote unquote, is in a, is a, a third in whatever, uh, formerly Artsakh, I'm going to call it that way, Azer, Azeri troops took up the entirety of this of this of this lake and took yeah. control of it um they yeah. did it for the need to control the water resources they did it for the need to control the high ground around in this area because to understand where it is this is the region of sunik right here the whole entire region and i believe that this is going to be this is now me speculating guys you can judge me later i believe that this is where this horrendous connection through uh, uh, Sunik is going to start coming through. So wow. we're talking about it wow. being, it happening right now. And we're talking about the atrocity of it happening, but only recently, because we Armenians are constantly gaslit and you can ask me any question you'd like about the, the, the atrocities that are kind of besieged on us, right? That are forced on us, that we forget to understand. What is this? Someone just pointed out. This, by the way, is a high ground. So they take this, they control this. This is Sunik, the region Richard, David, and I have been talking about while everyone in Yerevan thought we are crazy. Um, this is also the region that uh, the uh, prime minister signed off on an economic uh, deblockading of Nakhichevan to Azerbaijan. Right. And One Armenia of the being points. The first, the first Armenia becoming the first country ever to have a route go through it without any tariffs whatsoever, supported by also none other than our ally, uh, Russia. Finally, what is this? This is the fastest and the shortest connector wow. between the now formerly Artsakh regions and the Nakhichevan region, and the closest connector here. 
So that is actually why I think it's, you know, the seven that's, each has been taken. Yeah, number correct. one. That's a, that's a good point. Wow. Number one. And finally, I will just, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up my, my spiel. Um, this is also a waterway. It's a region that controls water, uh, a, lot of, a lot of waters, right? It's the high ground. It's where a lot of water sources originate from. Another problem that we are seeing, sorry, right here, boom. This, can everyone see this? So this is the uh, kind of the map of the watersheds in uh, Armenia and the Caucasus, right? The two major rivers being the Kur River from Tiflis, where I grew up, and the Arax River uh, that is the border between Armenia and Turkey, and also the little border right here uh, between Iran and Armenia and Nahichiran. Anyway, so these are the two major rivers and the watersheds around them and the tributaries that feed them and also feed Armenia, Lake Sevan, and every living thing creature that's in those areas. This is why Artsakh was so strategic. We had the high ground. We controlled a large portion of Azeri uh, waterways and water sources, and never once did we do anything bad to it. Now they control tributaries into Lake Sevan, and they can poison them. They also control tributaries into Sumik. And point number three of the many, many egregious news items that we've heard this past uh, uh, 24 hour cycle was that all of a sudden today, 300 plus Armenians woke up with stomach issues, which yeah, okay, you know, we will show this later. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this is part and parcel into what they are going to unleash on us. They're going to control high ground. They're going to control our waterways. And this is why I get so, so distraught and confused at the illiteracy of my brothers and sisters of not understanding the importance of Artsakh. Artsakh was a buffer zone. You know, I'm talking about this area right here. This is where the Black uh, uh, Sevlich is. I'll go back to the other map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, and currently, there's like 20 kilometers or if less between here and Nahichevan and what now Azerbaijan is. This used to be the border. There used to be 150 kilometers between that Nahichevan border and the nearest Azeri over there. So when Armenian mines from Yerevan tried to argue me, first of all, I asked, do you know the map and do you understand what you're talking about? Now we're at such a disadvantage. We're going to need everybody and their mother to help us. But my biggest concern with the news coming out of Armenia is that as it's happening, we get three different conflicting news articles. We got CivilNet kind of explaining things to the diaspora because they're the only ones doing things in, in, in English. Like, oh, this is supposed to happen. 30% is Azeri anyways. Well, riddle me this. Why is 100% of the lake now in Azeri possession? Mr. CivilNet, please explain it to us. Second of all, uh, the, 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 the uh, news, the way that it came out from the MOD, from the prime minister, and from the abundsmen were completely like, is it one kilometer, is it three kilometers? And then there was complete lack of any kind of indication what it are forces. We, you know, people on Instagram are asking, we still are a sovereign nation, right? Richard, David, we have our forces, right? And we are within the rights of defending ourselves because that is our land. Exactly. Where, was, where was our army? And why does Azerbaijan currently possess the entirety of that lake and why does the prime minister not have anything to answer for it? Sorry, yeah. I'm done. Yeah, he's having, there's just meetings going on. Uh, we'll get to it in a moment, but he he's called for, he's actually asking for CSTO help right now. That's the treaty that guarantees security for Armenia. Uh, but it is odd. We're asking the same question, right? On our group chat with the three of us, we're asking, where was our army? Where were the Russian peacekeepers that are supposedly on that border with Sunik, right? Or on that border, which was formerly... Artsakh, why, why was why were 250 uh, Azeri troops just able to cross over without well, any Well, because resistance? well yeah. for a couple of reasons. First of all, the the, the Russians are going to patrol every square millimeter, uh, and it's also Armenia's territory to monitor. And then we ask the Russians for help, and if that's not happening, then they're not going to. I mean, they're not going to do it, right? Right, right. So there were negotiations apparently that uh, almost two days of negotiations between Armenian soldiers, Azeris and Russian soldiers that apparently ended when I texted you guys earlier today with no conclusive result. What Why? does that mean? And Why? then they're still occupying. They're still occupying Why? there. And yes, Greg, we saw reports of three to three and a half kilometers, which is close to two miles that they have incurred. And they're incurred 
toward the village of Vereshen. So uh, that's a little bit further um, southwest, if you will, on that map, right? So yeah. uh, it's very concerning. Obviously, these are population centers of people that live there, uh, and there are now soldiers, um, 250 Azeri soldiers that are occupying this lake. Well, there were, there were also reports that they were digging trenches. Exactly, um, so, exactly. So, you know, there, there's there's all sorts of insane reports come, coming on. This is part of the, the discussion we were having earlier uh, you know, with our guests that, you know, if, if, if we're not getting clear information, uh, it's hard to make up, you know, it, it's hard to come to the, to, two, you know, to the truth. Two major points of clarifications. I, I appreciate uh, uh, you bringing this up, Rich and David. Um, you said something about the CSTO, which is the kind of the equivalent of the uh, Russian led uh, against like counter to the to the NATO. It's essentially the Russian led NATO. So you said uh, Armenian prime minister has asked for the help uh, of the CSTO and he invoked something called article two. You know, the NATO has something like that as well that once one nation gets attacked, they can invoke, I believe article uh, eight or nine of the, of whatever right. that is. And the, the other nations aren't supposed to, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, respond. And I'll be honest with you that the article through two, and I don't mean to laugh, uh, uh, states that it's invoking in the time of threat to the Armenian or one of the nation national borders, where in fact there's Article Four, which is uh, in the uh, in the in, in, in when when an attack on that same sovereign nation's border happens. So my question to the Prime Minister is why the technicality there? Why he took the softer of articles? When uh, tell me if three hundred people, three hundred armed forces coming into your land is a threat or an attack. I believe it's right. an attack. It's actually the definition of an attack. Finally, something I realized today, and this is something you know unscripted, we didn't talk about this, guys. CSTO, who are the nations that are part of it, right? If you look at the pan-Turkic movement, <laughs> like I just, it just dawned on me. I just don't have enough capacity to process it. You got Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, what do you call it, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, half those nations are actually part of the Turkish vision for the pan-Turkism. Because half the time when we talk about what is this pan-Turkic right. movement, right? So when people say CSTO, CSTO, yes, with Russia there, and uh, it makes things a little bit warmer, but with the other ones, especially, David, me and you reported on this years ago, and I remember that episode, when clearly some members of CSTO said, we are not going to protect Armenia when it comes to anything with Azerbaijan. And that was like a mind blowing situation because Armenia is a member of CSTO, Azerbaijan is not. Right. Okay. Right. The, so, yeah. mm -hmm. no, I was just going to say like the thing the in theory, right? The only way for Russia to not get involved to stop any kind of attack on Armenia proper would be if they made a deal to allow it theoretically, right? And I, because CSTO is supposed to guarantee that if they're asked. I don't, Go ahead. I don't, I don't want to get, in my opinion is this, we live in such precarious times, such of dangerous course. times. Of course. I don't want to get into what I think we, one day when we are secure enough, I will tell you my entire, I'm, I'm, I feel like very yeah. weird about- I'm not asking for opinion. No, 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 I'm no, asking no, no, for no. opinion. That in theory, that is supposed, that that's the case. That is but the that case. Alludes, that, that alludes to the fact that, that alludes to the fact that Russia has some kind of a desire for this to happen. And in reality, we don't know. What I right. do know and what we do know is that Ser Sarkeesian, the, his downfall started from the time that Arach Media started four years ago when they were, it was reported that they lost 800 square meters of Artsakh, where now we have an entire lake, not to mention all of Artsakh lost, right? Jeez. We have an entire lake and that's causing no pause for concern Right. For in a large quantity of the population. And well, that is I mean, the opposition, I opposition is is blaming it all on, on Bashir. Every and, single yeah. Armenian should be very worried about this right now. You are not going to be able to drink water once they poison Sevan. Right. Right. Think about yeah, that. These are these are very, very, very serious things. Uh, and, you know, again, it's not even a blip on any kind of Western media news at all, um, which, again, is beyond point, yeah
your and, point. And I'll tell you this: there's an inter, there's this uh, new age. Thank you, thank you, Rich. This is yeah. like an insane news article. Contaminated water causes intestinal infection to 370 residents in SUNY. Now we don't know if that's actually stemming from that lake. Right. But it's really, really crazy that it's happening right now and hasn't happened. Now, obviously, someone's going to run out and, ah, Armenian water sucks. No, 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 no. I drink right. Armenian water. It's like it's like being reborn when I go to Armenia. We are, right. you go to Yerevan and there's, there's Pupulaks, which is these water fountains everywhere. It's a great water source because it's pure and it's clean. So, man, you know, I don't to, know. Your, to, your, to, your, to your point, Greg, um, the silence in American media has been strident since the beginning of this entire thing. There have been a few people who've been speaking out, and I want to show them right now. Um, you know, on the you know, in, with, with let me let me click it on right here. Uh, so first of all, we've got um, Frank Pallone has been urging yes. the United States to make Azerbaijan withdraw. Yes. We also have Adam Schiff. Who has been calling Azerbaijan's uh, actions dangerous and provocative? Um, you know, we've got you know Macron, who's who's starting to speak up. Uh, yeah, but France huge. sold France sold weapons to Turkey, I believe. That, that's right. kind of yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so ahead. there's a little bit going on. Um, I and I think the problem, my problem, is is that as people talk, there's actions that are getting that that are ha happening and. Right. Um, Right. And, and you know, the, we all sadly knew this was coming. We knew this was coming. It was just a question of time. And that's what so many of us have been, uh, you know, trying to raise the alarm about. And it's been heartbreaking to, to, I feel like a crash test dummy. I feel like all we're, you know, the three of us are working hard to, to bring this information to people. But it, it's horrible watching it happen because we know that there are people who could do something about it. And well, we're going to schedule a meeting. Oh, well, we're going to talk about it some more. Like, why there aren't planes going over, I don't understand. Not only that, Rich, not only that, there was also an incursion next to Sisian, which right. is a large town, and also next to Varden. He's completely on the other side of the country. Right. So I'm just telling you that the government currently, with all of its reforms, came in and they reformed the crap out of our uh, military to the point of insane level of incompetence unable to thwart 300 uh, soldiers i mean is, is is this where we are yeah yeah because well, you look at what happened in tabush last july right we stopped their quote-unquote elite forces from azerbaijan from incurring in tabush why is that not happening now uh and of course the timing is perfect for azerbaijan yet again uh, again turkey doesn't have to do anything they just do it through azerbaijan you have fighting in gaza and between gaza and israel right you have that happening plus um you know that that's taking a lot of the attention right now plus you still have co and you have COVID in india you have uh and then you have uh political turmoil in armenia and you have uh, upcoming elections in armenia and in iran so they they are just perfectly timing everything and no one's saying a word about it except us it feels like why can i ask you all friends that are with me right now why do you all think someone needs to say something who is this magical yeah. fairy that's going to come to our rescue you're right except, you're for, right. except for ourselves that's yeah. number one number two it seems to me again i'm going to say sir sarkisian's beginning of his downfall was because of a loss of 800 square meters we lost way more than that in the war and there's way more than that there's three kilometers by reports three and a half kilometers right into the uh, to, and surrounding the entire lake that's way more than 800 square square meters exactly um why does this person get to uh, uh what do you call it, have such impunity right like wh well, wh wh what is what is, keep what in is mind, he's also acting right now see this limbo there's just the nation in limbo and uh you know we'll, we'll follow it closely he likely may be reelected if my step his party is reelected in these elections june 20. uh but you ask a good question bro you ask a really good question does it make sense who's gonna be left to elect him yeah yeah what's gonna be what you know i don't know I, you yeah. know i don't want to sound sound like a defeatist but you know you know there comes yeah. a, look if yerevan is the only city that is that is that 
is going to remain, then what's the point of all this? Right. You guys don't understand. Like, this is. The, I'm not saying you guys don't <laughs> understand, but this is. You know, if we're this is the discussion section. Um, when the when Armenia's government was forming in the in 1918 Republic, right? Remember Sardarapat? Everybody's talking about what we did. We thwarted the uh, the 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 army of Islam coming into uh, uh, what do you call it? Already the Republic of you know the, the Turkish Republic coming in, trying to you know, the Ottoman Empire fell and now it's the Ataturks people coming in and trying to like finish us off. One of the generals that was quoted to say that they, they said, hey, do you want to finish our uh, finish Armenians off? And he goes, no, we don't want to kill the entire Republic, but what we want to make sure is they have only Yerevan, Lake Sevan, and like three inches outside of Lake Sevan. So when they come out of Lake Sevan after a swim, they barely have a place to hang their uh, shoes to wash and, and dry. That was a quote, and I'll find it and I'll do it again. And it's now happening. It's now happening. It is. This, of... this, this is the start of that. And again, everyone seems to have this false sense of, oh, it's not going to happen, but we're, we're witnessing it right now. Ask and yourself, it's... ask yourself who's going to come to our aid. Yes, we have this arbiter of uh, stability, Russia, but Russia will be playing. They haven't stopped this so far. They didn't even stop these 250. And then these negotiations, everybody leaves. No resolution from these negotiations. I mean, look, it's good that there has not been actual physical fighting that we know of, right? But right, they, but that's but that's a, camp out there. They're gonna but, camp out there. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry. No, there, 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 there. There's some additional context to put to this because uh, there's a couple of things that we haven't mentioned, and I think it's definitely worth mentioning. That's why I mentioned it. Two things. Number one, I'm gonna show the screen really quickly. That um, you know. As was the case during the last, you know, dur during this first provocation, what they did is Azerbaijan and Turkey said, we're going to hold some military exercises yes, nearby. Yes, thank you. We're thank just going to sort of, we're going to practice some stuff. And then they sent people in as a little incursion just to test the waters to see what would happen. And then when Armenia retaliated and said, whoa, you can't come in here, they said, oh, look, you guys attacked our soldiers. Now we're going to send pe people in, and that's exactly what happened just now. Right. Uh, you know, They're the first thing is, and I'm going to show the, the the screen is that you know they are planning on having large scale military exercises right yes. now. Fifteen thousand on May 16 through 18, right? Fifteen thousand right. soldiers. Yes. So, um, so the, the and and the, the, there's a couple other points to make on this. Um, so, so this incursion into this lake was predicated on the idea that they said, well, we have maps that say this is ours, but it's actually Soviet era maps that have been doctored, right? And there's there's a couple of articles, I'll have to find them, mm -hmm. um, but they suggested that this was a doctored map or doctored maps that, that, that they have. And so the, 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 the only sort of maybe hall pass I might give this administration is not sending in troops immediately to provoke anything. But we the problem is, is we're dealing with an enemy who doesn't care about the rules of engagement because they obviously haven't even returned all of our POWs. And on top of that, they've even admitted to killing many POWs and a lot of the, not even- Actually, they have now, they yeah. have now. Yeah, they have now. Right. Yeah. So we're dealing with a horrible enemy and we have very little support. And on top of that, and this, is, this is the point I was trying to make earlier today, the Biden administration gave us a little carrot by saying, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna say it was know. genocide, but with the other hand, we're still going to give Azerbaijan $100 million, which they then turned, turned around and bought weapons, and now they're using them against us. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't care about the genocide recognition anymore. It's, 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 it's horseshit. Yeah, it's, it's betrayal what happens. Betrayal, because they're still going to, there's still our tax money, the three of us and everybody watching that's a U.S. citizen that pays taxes. Uh, even if you're not a citizen, you still pay taxes in this country, I believe, right, guys? So our tax dollars are going to fund a genocidal regime. Yes, they are, even though our yeah. genocide was recognized. To me, I completely agree with you, Rich. I would have waited on genocide recognition. I could have waited if I knew the trade-off was going to be still guys, giving money guys, to Azerbaijan. Friends, friends, but let's, let's bring it I, back. Yeah. I appreciate you all. What has happened to our nation when we're constantly waiting for somebody? United States will save us. Russia will save us. No, that's that's BS, man. We got to get the people that are failing us out of the government. And then we got to get to the rebuilding 
from a very, very already weakened uh, standpoint. Okay, so, so, and this may be too big a conversation to have right now, and I don't disagree with you, but when we say rebuilding, yo, we're going to need allies. That's why when we talk about we need the United States and we need Russia, we need these other people. Yo, we're going to need trading partners. We're going to need, you know, military allies. We're going to need, this is, not a, this is not a singular effort. This is a group effort. That's the only way any of this works. I mean, right. you know, what it's, it, it, you know, the, you know, we are not, Armenia is not even, it is not as big as the United States or Russia or even Great Britain or India or any of these other countries that have large armies and have a large infrastructure. We're talking about this, this fledgling idea, this flame that we're trying to uh, make, protect from the wind. You know, and for 30 years, I mean, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. I think that's why we're doing this show is that we're trying to con con contribute as adults. But I can remember watching this, watching, watching Armenia become Armenia, you know, in the modern age. I, I was a teenager. I couldn't, I, I don't know, I didn't know what was going on. My father tried to talk to me a little bit about it, but I, you know, I just, I didn't get it. Right. But I think as a diaspora, we can't have it both ways. We can't just like claim Armenian and then I contribute. You know what I'm saying? So to your point, Greg, you're right. We have to focus our energies to, to build, but we're going to need allies to do it. That's my Finally, point. Finally, uh, Richard, you said it well, and uh, we will need to wrap it up soon. Um, I just want to, like this notion of internationalism that's being kind of comes through academia, through these newfound laws and reforms. Yo, we're bringing enemies into our, into into armenia okay these are great ideas in the broader world armenia needs to be protectionist armenia needs to protect its resources protect its sovereignty and then we can start talking about you know economic integrations um and all sorts of deblockating when they're saying this economic corridor that they're going to build it's only to help Turkey link itself to Baku and, 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 not, and not need to enter Iran ever again. You're going to need to see what's going to happen afterwards and how hard it's going to be to, to unblock that road. David and Rich, back to us being Nostradamus. Yeah. We said Sunik, and yeah. now we're talking about this road. I don't understand why every Armenian, all of you out there that went and are contributing and are now in Yerevan, and are now from the diaspora doing things in Armenia. Why you're not talking about this horrendous, horrendous, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, freeway that's going to be built over Armenia? Yeah, I, Greg, I think you pointed it out. Why are we not talking about that? I was wondering why Black Lake, uh, but you nailed it, I think, very sadly. That's, you know, it's the closest point right there to get over to the other side. And so they're trying, like, Aliyev has said it. They've been very transparent about what they're going to do, right? They've been very right. transparent. We will take it by force if Armenia does not do this. So, and it was one, sadly, one of the nine point capitulations was to allow for this railway um, or transit route across Armenia uh, in the southern province. So, look, we're going to keep a close eye on it. Um, you know, perhaps we can touch very quickly guys on the pow's uh because baku did admit to killing armenian captives and freedom house uh has called for azerbaijan to allow a human rights court to investigate reports of uh, detainee torture so that is some well, i'm sure they're gonna let that happen sure yeah right they're gonna right, they're yeah. gonna absolutely they're gonna welcome it they're gonna put them on first class to get them yeah, in there right right yeah right yeah right uh but yes so baku has admitted this um and then thank thank you Freedom House for their work. Uh, we definitely we're working on uh, getting some uh, some speakers or guests from Freedom House to join us at some point. But uh, these are important developments about the POWs. The only other thing I'll add is uh, Armenian report shared it. Uh, sorry again, don't worry about a, a link here, Rich. But Armenian report shared it that the International Red Cross has been visiting uh, the POWs. We don't know how many or where. Uh, or their condition, but they have been visiting them and they have been uh, allowing, or not allowing, they have been get, uh, they have been, uh, how do I say this? There has been communication between these POWs and their families through the Red Cross. 
Uh, but I wonder again, if there was communication to the ones that got killed too prior prior to that. Because I really want us to understand what's happening. Know, there was an I Armenian know. yesterday, and today he's not there. Okay? I know. So I sink know. that in to everybody in Yerevan, to everybody in San Francisco. There was an Armenian there yesterday, and now he's not there. And there could have been a Red Cross person talking to him that had zero ability to intervene and do anything else exactly. because they are in control of our brothers and sisters' lives. Exactly. Uh, I want to segue into something that uh, I think every Armenian needs to, uh, you know, we do a lot of genocide advocacy, right? Um, but I was listening to a podcast by Americans, and I'll share it in a future episode. And they were going very, very methodically through the genocide. And I know it's not a fun thing to, to, to listen to, but I think it's important. And they were talking about Urfa, where your grandmother and grandfather's ancestors are from. And they were talking about the resistance in Vaughan and how they completely wiped out Erzurum, which is the namesake of my wine company. But then they talked about something else. They talked about the Hamidian massacres prior to that, that uh, 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 killed 300,000 Armenians. And then the massacres the in... Yeah, and then the massacres in Adana in the uh, uh, leading up to the Armenian genocide, not part of the Armenian genocide, which was 1915. And then there, there was a Jewish scholars actually that wrote a book that I think I'm gonna buy called the 30 year genocide. They actually have the audacity and the right audacity to say that no, the genocide did not happen in 1915. It was a slow moving genocide. And I'm actually going to explain to the rest of the diaspora that when the thawing of the Soviet Union happened and the pogroms in Baku, Ganja, and Sumgait happened, it was again the continuation of genocide. And the reason why when me and you brothers and sisters were visiting Shushi and it was completely leveled to the ground, it wasn't because of the war in Artsakh recently. It was because of what they did to the Armenian quarter in 1920s. Okay, so why am I saying all this? Upon all of this, we want to build a, 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 a cross-border friendly relations. What kind of people are we to think Brett, that- Brett, they... Where are you hearing this? I'm not what? hearing this. Is this in Clubhouse stuff? Because I want to call that All out. All sorts of stuff. I'm not yeah, hearing absolutely, that. I'm not absolutely, someone pushing absolutely. that. I don't That's, think any I'm, of us here are pushing Armenian, that. But well, let's because, clarify this. Mm -hmm. These are certain people that are calling for that. Absolutely. And it is none of us here. None of us are going to stand for that either. So just what are you, what are you talking? David, I think, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I think I'll open up your eyes and have my eyes as well. I, I just it's want to the, back up the, for a second. It's the Yerevan administration right now. What are you talking about opening up and deblocking the unblocking of the Armenian borders? Who are you going to deal with? You know, all of these, uh, what do you call education ministers traveling to Istanbul, having all sorts of, uh, uh, what do you call symposiums, trying to cozy up to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Uh, Turkey saying, hey, we'll invest in Armenia, blah, 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 this, this, and that. They're not going to invest in Armenia. They're going to buy you. That's right. what they want to do. Right. Rich, you were saying right. that. No, I just, I, I, I was going to say, you know, we could get into the, into the weeds and we can get into the nitty gritty on this all we want. But I think there's a bigger point that we need to address. And that is something I was starting to a minute ago in the taking personal responsibility for the 30 years that we've had to invest in this country. Now, we can say whatever we want about Israel. We can say whatever we want about the Jewish nation. We can say whatever we want about the Zionists. And we can say whatever we want about how they've affected the Middle East. But I have to tip my hat to them for going in there and arming themselves to the teeth. And you know what we've done? We've bought Louis Vuitton bags. And we, and we drive G-Wagons. And we've done everything except arm ourselves to the teeth. And... Because let's yeah, you're right. Because in the diaspora, in the diaspora. Yeah, in the diaspora. I'm talking about like 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 my father and his father were like, you got to get the get the f out of here because there's too much bullshit going on. You got to go go until there's peace. Well, you know what? If that was a Jew saying that, that that wouldn't have happened. They would have said, come here and fight. But why the hell weren't we doing that? I'm just gonna call ourselves out on. This. Because well, that's it's what we important. should be doing. And, and David, actually, uh, to, to like clearly our, our, our spheres of interconnectivity, uh, like as social spheres are a little bit different, right? The amount of uh, like Armenia just got attacked. And I'm really, really happy for Armenians being in lockstep solidarity with the Palestinian movement, even though that Palestinian movement also was very pro Azeri. But I'm okay because I like to be on the right side of the truth. And the average Palestinian is actually closer to an Armenian as some of our friends from there, David, you and I, Rich, know, will say, 
But the juxtaposition of the issue that I have to say, and I have to point out back to my woke Armenians, the amount of posting I have seen on Instagram and Facebook about the plight of the Palestinians versus the death of Armenia right, right. has been probably, if I was to like statistically align it, it was a uh, one to 15 probably. No, no, one to 20. Why, why do you think that is? That's beyond concern. I don't know. Right? Self-hatred, incompetence, is, inability is it, to love yourself. I don't is know. It, is it that or is uh, it, could it be? That's a deeper conversation. It's could it like be that, Could it be that actually all they're seeing is that and they don't see us? They don't no. see what's happening to no, us? No, the only reason they don't see us is because they're not investigating. We see us. Why the hell well, don't they? We, we have a show. We have a show to no, see. No, 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 I'm no, talking no, about no, we go, no, no, we go no, look no. for Armenian-related issues. No. If you're an Armenian, you're posting more about the, the whatever's going on in Israel and Palestine. I think it's great to, to build bridges and to be cross-referencing and to be you know right. getting allies. That's right. There's no problem with that. No, but no, if you no, know no. more about their stuff than you do about our stuff, guys, the problem guys, is guys. you're not thinking about our stuff. Gentlemen, right. gentlemen, I'm gonna I'm gonna k- kill you right now with this. We're assuming I'm talking about the woke Armenians in the diaspora. I'm talking about very, very plugged in Armenians in Yerevan. I've seen more about Palestine from Yerevan Armenians than wow. about Sunni. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. So oh. yeah. Yeah. So, I don't so. know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. look, guys, you know, <laughs> to not to uh, I mean, look, there's not much good news. I was mentioning it to Rich. When we were uh, prepping, Greg, when, before you joined, the there's not a lot of good news right now. There's not a lot of positive things for us to to focus on. Yet there is one. It's, this is not a positive thing I'm about to say. Okay. You, we brought up the genocide. We are still positive. seeing we're still seeing cultural genocide of Artsakh, and that's something we also need to be aware of. There's something very very gruesome that is happening. Um, but the foreign minister of Artsakh, David Babayan, uh, has pointed out that uh, they believe that gravestones, Armenian gravestones, have been used as construction material in now occupied Artsakh. Uh, I mean, and it's, I, I'm not surprised. And I, I, I don't understand. We, we had Matthew Karanyan on, guys. Come on. The Kurdish villages in eastern uh, Turkey are built from the Khachkars of Armenia. Like, this is, this is why, like, you know, like, they are saying they have a blueprint for how nasty they will be to us. And they've showed it to us. Yet every time we're like, oh my God. And thank you, David, for pointing this out. But like. No, you're right. They've also been very transparent about what they're going to do to us, right? And they're actually doing it. So, but but yeah, they're not, they're not telling the world that they're doing that. The gravestones as construction material, but they are saying we're going to take Sunni. They are saying, uh, you know, they want us all dead, right? So. Good. Yeah. I'm glad they're doing it. You know why? Because, you know, now we get to haunt them in life. And when I see them in hell, I'm going to hate them there too. Amazing. Well, I, hopefully, because Rich, I, don't, I don't think you'll be in hell, man. Uh, but, you know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'll roll the dice. Yeah, go on, man. I'm not going to, go um, I can't. I, if there's one thing I've learned in this world is that you can never tell what's going to happen. I, I really would like to believe that uh, this is going to be okay and that, you know, there will be some consensus and that we will get some support and that we yeah. will be able to build this fledgling nation and and whether it be from afar or just dropping all ties here and focusing and going uh, i don't know how this is going to play out i know that it's heartbreaking i know that it is very consuming i know that you know recently in the past in the past couple months i've i've had in you know arguments with people some more heated than others some most people are are you know, compassionate. Uh, but I literally had someone say that I am sucking all the air out of the room and talking about this stuff all the time. And besides both middle fingers, I gave him, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it would be, it would, it, it would be much easier for me to live a life that isn't Armenian. It would be much easier to live a life where I don't think about this and this isn't consuming and this doesn't affect me. But first of all, you know, in the rock and roll world, my name is Rich Cass. Everybody knows me as Rich Cass. Not everybody, but on my on my Facebook profile, Richard Barton Kazanjian. Because if you want to know who I am, you better know the whole thing, or else I don't even want to know who you are. You know, and and so my life would have much faster velocity if I if I wasn't really thinking about my Armenianness. But but that's impossible. 
And I would also argue that it is the height of white privilege to be able to try and ignore that and say, oh, I'm not going to think about that. But I, I can't think, I, I can't, I, I can't do that any more than anybody else can, can reject their color or anything else about themselves. And I just think that, you know, as an Armenian nation, we just got to get a little bit more vigilant and, and realize that we are constantly under fire and we're going to have to fight, fight a way through it because, right. um, and, and David, uh, we uh, have to keep talking about it. We oh, have for sure, to hundred percent, hundred percent. Greg, go ahead. You know, we have five more minutes left because I'm assuming we're going to round out to 10 30. Um, Thank you for those that are listening. No, we have two more minutes left for you. Two more right? minutes? Okay, so well, my clock is wrong. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, yeah. So here, here's here's what I got to say. Uh, David, you asked me a question. Who are those people that are thinking about all these internationalisms? Well, first of all, it's these people that are, uh, you know, heads of these NGOs in Armenia, where the idea is always, hey, you you you, you yourself understood, even the USAID, the, uh, who was it? Uh, some one, one of the people in the uh, either Armenian Assembly or NCA mentioned to us, it was, you know, Armenia was tasked with the force of, uh, with the with the task of opening itself up to the peace with Azerbaijan, while Azerbaijan was tasked with arming itself to, you know, kill us. You know what I mean? Like, and it's these forces that are kind of constantly working against us. And on top of it, they also, uh, what do you call it, feed off of Armenians that I've met, hundreds of them that talk about the the, 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 the the peace lovers in Baku while most of Azerbaijan wants us dead. I would like to come to a point where I would talk about the peace lovers of Baku towards Armenians, but I've heard even their political dissidents talk about Armenians. They want political freedom in Azerbaijan, but they still want you and I dead, okay? That's just too and sweet. same thing happens with a, a, lot of, a, a lot of queer activists in Istanbul, they still like I've I've talked to a very 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 let's do it one more time very liberal Turks where I had to still argue the Armenian genocide to them, okay, and these are very 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 it's, three times more very liberal Turks the ones that you know almost look like a white man you know what I mean it's institutionalized so, for hundred plus years or more what it is is wow these two dudes like and i know we don't like being talked about like how some white people explain our genocide to us well the the, the two-hour podcast was so amazing i will share it to the two of you they like literally were and then they're talking about us from like the third point of view right them and them and the, like these people hate armenians like these two white guys are saying and i'm thinking they're going hmm these guys got it why does some of our Armenians don't get it? Like, I'm just curious. Right. Why not? You know, you know. I, I, I don't know. Did, maybe because I, they've only because they've only grown up with, you right. know, with handmade bread and water festivals. I don't know. I don't right. know why they, they need don't to get be it. educated. They probably need to be educated, Greg. They oh oh no, David. Unfortunately, these people are very, very well educated. It's something else, man. It's no, I mean something. educated about this. Oh, but about this, you're you're about absolutely this, right. About this. Just, you know, like, so. You know, look, uh, you know, we have we have other allies that are journalists and so on. You know, Lindsey Snell, uh, Neil Howard. You know, like Neil that. Howard is a very, very bad man. We'll talk about uh, that. OK, okay. Some, some good things he's done. But yeah, the, there's we have some allies uh, that are constantly reporting on this that you're talking about, Greg. The, just Emil, the Emil Giesen. Yeah, More Emil Giesen, of course. Yeah, Emil Giesen. Uh, the, about the pure hatred, though, like they're, they're continuing to report about the, the museum that they built uh, dehumanizing Armenians. Uh, in in Baku, so like for example, anyway, it was, we have it was a park. Yes. It was. <laughs> it's a park. Park. Yeah, it's outdoor park. Yes, but yeah. look, guys, why don't we uh, why don't we wrap up with some of the action items uh, because there are things we can be doing to try to take action. Action uh, item number one: love yourself and your nation. There you go. <laughs> Amen. Um, number two. Register for the virtual gala. The link is in the in the feed. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some guests, uh, the co-chairs of the United AIO project, which is uh, working on initiatives for the benefit of Armenia. Uh, register for that. Submit proposals for ways to help uh, the critical needs of Armenia. And then there's a new Armenian caucus letter um, headed by David Val Valdeo uh, Velado. I forget his last name. No, Velado. Yeah, uh, which is calling on Secretary Blinken to cut all current aid to Azerbaijan um, and uh, enforce the removal of these troops of, uh, excuse me, let me give you the exact 
what the letter is doing. Stop U.S. arms and aid to Azerbaijan. So it's a letter from the Armenian caucus. Uh, so we want to contact your, your members of Congress to sign on to this letter uh, because it want, it's seeking to freeze the existing U.S. military assistance to Azerbaijan and block any future aid that contributes directly to Azerbaijan's military operation. I just want to give a, a quick shout out uh, to Assembly Member uh, Kevin Mullen, who is now a, a new caucus member of the Armenian caucus here in California. Yes. Uh, he joins uh, pro tem yes. Tony Atkins, Bob Herzberg, Scott Wilk, who we helped get reelected, uh, Bob Archuleta, uh, and uh, Andreas Borges, Brian Dolly, uh, and, 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 and of course, Anthony Portantino, who's a strong supporter, uh, yeah. and, and uh, Eloise Gomez. And many others, and of course Adrian Nazarian, who's uh, one of our staunch supporters as well. Uh, so the Armenian the Armenian caucus in California is growing. Um, but you know, uh, just a quick shout out to a brand new member. Yeah, so, absolutely. So all right, thank, thank you, guys. you guys. And uh, the links will be up uh, in the feed. And uh, join us again next week on Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, consider uh, subscribing to us on the YouTube channel because we're going to be building con our content library and we're going to be going live there too. Um, pay attention to your emails because you'll be getting, you know, updates on the content uh, and what upcoming shows are going to be like. So, and follow us on Instagram if you can as well. I hate to be the digital pimp, but you know, that, that, that's the world we live in and we definitely need your support. Absolutely. And uh, we, we have some great guests lined up and uh, some pertinent conversations. Most importantly, you know, educate yourself. Google what Sunik is, what's in Sunik, how important that land is. Yeah. Um, we have because to I keep, hate arguing Armenians, man. We, I don't we like, have to keep we have so much. We have so much. Yeah, we have so much to argue against us. I just don't like arguing one one another. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. No need, um, yeah. Palestine's important, but not as important as Sunik to me. Okay. Right. Donation. All right. Donation. All right. All right, guys. Cheers. All right. Take Good care. Good night. Thanks, everybody, for watching.